Hello, Brick Lane. We sure are living in a rapidly changing world, aren't we? And I suspect I'm not alone in having pondered at some length the, uh, the, the, the volume of things that have just been coming at us and the seriousness of the things that have been coming at us in recent months. Of course, COVID and all the lockdowns and changes that have taken place because of that. The protests all over our nation and our nation's cities, uh, the looting, the vandalism, the tearing down of statues uh, that has accompanied all of that. And then there's the stuff that always runs in the background that we see and hear about in the news. Uh, the ongoing reality of human trafficking all around the world and even here uh, at home. We think about the, the young Amish girl that recently vanished from our community and Many of us, I'm sure the Lord has woken up in the middle of the night to, to pray for her and to pray for her family and the grief and the sorrow they must all be experiencing. All these things combined have forced me into a place where I, 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 I've been thinking about where in Scripture do we see people who dealt with both real adversity and significant change in their life in a very compressed period of time who actually dealt well and responded well to what they were experiencing. So what I'd like to do right now is I'm going to take two passages and very briefly attempt to combine them and show us a picture of some young men who responded very well to adversity. I'll first be looking at Jeremiah chapter 29, and I'm going to be linking that to Daniel chapter 1. So if you have a Bible, you may want to turn there. So picture, the exiles in Judah have been carried away into Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar and are now they're away from their homeland. And Jeremiah is left in Jerusalem. And from Jerusalem, the Lord commands him to draft a letter to the exiles living in Babylon. I want you to hear some of the content of that famous letter. Starting in Jeremiah uh, 29 verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So picture here, God himself is saying, I am the one who carried them into exile. He says, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. So here you have the Lord God writing through Jeremiah, and he's telling people, I'm the one who sent you into exile. And I'm telling you, settle down there, build homes, plant your gardens, have weddings, and allow your people to grow. How counterintuitive is that? You've been sent away into a foreign land where you're surrounded by people who don't speak your language and who don't understand your language. And God is saying, not only do I want you to settle here and increase in number, I'm asking you to seek the prosperity of the place where I have sent you. Many of us in today's world feel like, I don't recognize this land, this culture where I'm living. It almost seems foreign. It seems alien to me. And I suspect it's going to feel that way for quite some time. I want to read now from Daniel chapter 1 about a number of men who responded to Jeremiah's counsel while living in exile. Reading here from Daniel 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hand of into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put the treasure and put it in the treasure house of his God. 
Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men, without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But David resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other men your age? The king would have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food, and treat your servants in, accordan, in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for ten days. What's remarkable to me about that passage is you have men clearly of standing, understanding, no physical defect, bright, smart. They understood what was going on. They're young men. They're carried away to a foreign land. It is not natural for young men who've been torn away from their homelands to feel good about the place to which they have been carried. Look at the submission that takes place here. These guys were to be trained for three years. They were required to learn the language of the Babylonians, the literature, the arts, and everything that had to do with Babylonia. And when there was something that violated their consciences, that had to do with their dietary uh, requirements, they made, a re they made an appeal, but they made a respectful appeal. What's fascinating is to learn later on the kind of wisdom that the Lord bestows on Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How he reaches into these men's lives and gives them gifts that are just absolutely stunning, which are recorded throughout the book of Daniel. Um, in studying uh, Jesus' advent, one of the things I found fascinating is when we, when we read about the coming of the wise men from the east when Jesus was born, many commentators think it's, it's very likely that those wise men who came from the east, who likely came from the area in Persia where Daniel and his comrades were sent, that these guys could have been disciples or followers of Daniel, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these guys. So think about that, brothers and sisters. What would God have you and I do as we respond to this different world in which we're living? A place that feels alien, a place that feels strange. We miss the old culture that we used to enjoy and had embraced. It's a new day. It really is. Will we be wise like Daniel and his friends? Or will we continue to fight if we actually believe that our God is sovereign over every event that takes place in our lives, how can we not also say, the Lord has carried us here to this day and this time, and we're going to rest in His sovereignty in all these things. Lord bless you as you think about these things. It's a lot to swallow, I know. But our God really is sovereign, and He really is good.